Welcome to the Criterion Chat, a podcast about cinema and the Criterion Collection. I'm Matt Peterson, joined by Nate Myers. Tonight, Cold War, directed by Pavel Pawlikowski. The tale begins in 1949 in post-war Poland. Victor, played by Tomasz Kot, and Irina, played by Agata Klusesa, are holding singing auditions. They are forming a musical company to revitalize interest in traditional Polish folk songs, resurrecting a cultural identity that was all but erased by the preceding years of conflict. Victor meets Zula, played by Joanna Kulig, a talented singer and free spirit, who embodies his ambition to lead the artistic constraints of his homeland. Success turns into political propaganda, as the government minders who ultimately control their fates personally and professionally aim to use the company to further the cause of communism and diminish the ethnic traditions of Poland. A journey begins between Berlin, Paris, and points beyond as Victor and Zula balance their love and their desire for freedom. Shot in gorgeous black and white in a 4x3 aspect ratio, Cold War is a visually nostalgic journey through a time of doomed love. Released by Amazon in the United States, the film came to the Criterion Collection last year. Join Nate and me as we wage a hot war over Cold War. So Nate, uh, this is a more recent film, I suppose, that's been added to the Criterion Collection. Um, It seems like Criterion has a a decent relationship with most studios at this point, including streaming outlets. So we have, I think we mentioned, you know, Netflix titles coming to Criterion with The Irishman being the bigger one forthcoming and and now this one coming from Amazon Studios. So I was a bit uh, surprised to see that they were releasing this, but, but pleasantly surprised and it seems to, to fit in their wheelhouse. Um, so just kind of a more of a historical note there. Uh, any... Any thoughts just from the get-go on, on Criterion um, and the relationship with these streaming services before we get into the film itself? I'm glad the relationship seems to be there and seems to be a fortuitous one for both parties because I think it means we'll get some decent actual physical media coming out of these releases. I know we were just discussing recently by text about just what you know the sense of the value of a physical media and yet realizing a lot of the streaming is so good that not necessarily getting a physical copy of a film uh, isn't that big of a loss in terms of at least the viewing experience, the sound experience on home theater system. But for me, there always is something nice about having an actual disc, seeing, especially with Criterion, the kind of artwork that they'll come up with, coming up with the different supplements that are going to be a part of these releases. So I'm very excited. I, I hope it continues to be something that both Criterion and these other studios will be able to find that's beneficial to them both. And I hope other studios will get in on this as well, because I think we're going to see more and more that it's just not going to be particularly profitable for Warner Brothers, Paramount, uh, obviously Disney to be doing physical media so much. But if they're willing to license things out to Criterion for good, high quality releases, I think it'd be great. So hopefully this show is to be very good for Netflix Amazon, other streaming services, and these other companies might do the same thing. Yeah, it's encouraging to know that titles like this are not just going to get lost in the the ether, you know, of all the streaming content out there. So it's encouraging that um, the studios seem open to releasing some of their films uh, physically. But yeah, this is a big one uh, for Amazon, a big acquisition for them. Uh, this is a big title at the Cannes Film Festival in, in uh, 2018. Yeah, one best director and, for Pawlikowski. Yeah, so kind of a coup, I think, that Amazon uh, Studios picked this up. And I, I was excited when I heard that because I, I knew that meant that, you know, be able to see it pretty easily uh, through their, their prime um, streaming venue. But, I, I mean, this got a limited theatrical release as well. Can I tell a little story about that? Yeah, I tried. Sure. I tried to see this in the theater, and the day I it was back uh, when the theater when the movie came out in the theaters here in Minnesota, it was just extremely brutally bitterly cold, and things were closing down. And so there was oh, a ironic. day. 
Yes, indeed. And so I thought, well, you know what? Office is closed today. Everyone's gone home from the office. I'm going to go ahead and make the trip out to the independent art house theater that was showing it in the cities here and drove there. And everything online was telling me it was going to be great and open. And I got there and I saw a big sign saying, we are closed due to the cold weather. And I thought, damn it. (laughs) So I never got to see it in the theater. Um, so yeah, I was uh, glad that I was glad that it was streaming because that meant I could see it. Yeah, well, I, I guess maybe we'll just start with the director. I, I don't know if you've seen any of his other films. The only other film of his I've seen is um, Ida, which is visually very similar to this. I, I, I did see that in the theater, uh, and that's uh, a story about a group of nuns. And it also, it was in 4x3, black and white, very, very similar, just aesthetic. Uh, did you, I, I don't think you've seen that, Nate, or have you seen that by now? Or Nope, I haven't. I know it's one that I, I need to get to. I've never gotten around to it. So this is my first with Pavlikovsky. Yeah, it's worth checking out. I I think he did another film prior to that, too, and I, I haven't seen that. Well, his background, um, I think, was originally... So he's from Poland, but then he moved to England as a boy, I think, if I'm remembering mm-hmm. correctly, and then did documentary work for a while before he went into these uh, fiction works. Yeah, I think, he, I mean, he's kind of newer to narrative film, it seems. Um, so he doesn't really have a lot under his belt, but he's made a pretty big impact, at least in the art house scene here already. And it's pretty easy to see why. I mean, this and this is by far his most widely uh, known and, and I think positively received film at this point. I, Ida, I think, had pretty good reviews, but uh, that that title was pretty under the radar, I think, for a lot of people and um, certainly, you know, didn't get the kind of prestige placement that this film did with the Amazon platform. Um, but yeah, Amazon really pushed this film as, as uh, something to be featured and uh, it's kind of encouraging, I guess, that Amazon does notice films like this too, and, and is it willing to to pay for them to distribute them widely? So, um, it was uh, definitely nice to see. Um, but I just, I guess, we'll start with initial overall reactions. I, I think one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this film is we seem to have conflicting viewpoints on it, uh, at least to a degree. I, I our recent uh, deep focus conversation on 2001 i think had a similar starting place to say well we know we kind of have different different outlooks on this film so it's maybe worth exploring our our um our differences over it so uh, what were your initial reactions to cold war it was not the movie i expected i think that's the thing that most uh <laughs> struck me as i was i was watching it I, I've, I've watched it twice now and, you know, I think from the trailer and from just the, the general reputation and buzz it got out of some critic circles, I didn't really read too many reviews, but I just kind of followed generically the the sense of the reaction to it. I thought this was going to be a little bit more sumptuous, a little bit more epic. And then I saw this film and it was so much more small scale. And, I mean, it's an extremely limited cast. You have... A very fragmented storytelling. It isn't sweeping the way I expected it to be. Uh, so it was quite, quite different. I obviously recognized that, yes, it was going to be in the academic, uh, or excuse me, the academy ratio for the uh, filmmaking. I knew it was going to be black and white, all that stuff. But I expected it to be maybe a little bit more bold in, in, in terms of the, the characterizations than what it wound up being. And so I think I was taken off guard, but in a way that I actually really came to appreciate, uh, because I think this film, by stripping away sort of the grandness of what it could have been, uh, actually gets at a little bit of what life is like behind the Iron Curtain and bouncing back and forth in Europe during the Cold War, uh, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, uh, and just the sense of isolation that could exist within it, the frustrating nature of of having your art being propagandized right uh so i think this film because it actually defied what i expected of it wound up really speaking to me on a very um emotional level because i think it wound up actually really creating a sense of what a a a doomed romance of sort 
would be in this kind of political and social environment? It's very much a take on the Romeo and Juliet story, right? I mean, I, maybe not in the most traditional sense, but certainly where the the story ends up seems to be lifting directly from that. I, I, I'm with you that I, I've seen this twice now. You know, my initial reaction to it was kind of lukewarm. I mean, I, I felt that visually it's spectacular. I mean, the film is beautiful to look at. Uh, I, I can't remember seeing such crisp black and white photography combined with a shallow depth of field. And some of the, the some of those shots are just extraordinary. And um, uh, Pawlikowski is obviously a big fan of negative space. So the framing, and Ida had a lot of this too. Um, the framing has got a lot of headroom and, you know, really uses full, full use of that four by three ratio. Maybe we can go into the cinematography a little more in detail later, but initially that's what struck me the most was just visually how strong it was. And, and I felt like the film was really depending on that too much to carry it. Uh, and it does carry it to a great degree. I think the performances are strong. I, I just, I had a real hard time connecting, I guess, with the characters and I felt the characters were, uh, not fleshed out enough and not terribly likable either, especially in the case of uh, Zula or uh, Joanna Kulik's character and not a knock against her performance, which I think is quite good. Uh, it just, it didn't connect with me the way I was hoping it would. And, and seeing Ida, I guess I came into this kind of knowing the director's style and kind of expecting this film to be the way it was, but it just felt, uh, thematically more empty than I expected, even though again visually production design is great. Uh, I actually felt some of the supporting roles were, were even stronger than the the main characters. Uh, but ultimately, the chemistry that you would want to see in a tale of doom romance, I felt just wasn't there, and it just wasn't delivering. But you know, but seeing the second, that... oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say, seeing it a second time, I. I, I I appreciated it a bit more. Um, and, and after I watched it the first time, I felt like, okay, maybe this is a film that will reward repeat viewings. And, and you know, God knows there's plenty of movies I've seen that I flat out didn't like initially and have grown to really like. And this might be one of those. But um, my initial reaction was not great. It, it was one of disappointment, actually. Yeah, and so I guess I, I wasn't 100% certain what to expect having no experience with Pawlikowski's work before so I didn't have a sense of oh this is how he works or this is the way this film would maybe play other than just the general concept of a star-crossed lover's uh, tale right but mm -hmm. I think the fact that it subverted my usual uh, expectations of that is what made me speak uh, made it speak to me and I can agree with you to a certain extent the there isn't that kind of immediate chemistry we find with Victor and uh, Zula that you might expect in something like a um, Romeo and Juliet, you know, since you referenced that. But I think that's partly the point of this. Uh, these are a, this is a doomed romance right from the start, and you can see it. And I think the film is better for not having made it seem like, oh, they actually had a chance. I never saw for a second in this relationship anything that could ever possibly work out. And I don't think we're supposed to. I think we're supposed to see something that's guaranteed to fall apart. Uh, Victor is obviously a, a worldly man, and he is uh, a, an artist, and he's committed to his art. Zula is extraordinarily self-centered, and we can get this from her backstory that we learn about, that she's uh, obviously at odds with the Polish Communist Party, uh, has killed her father. We don't really know the whole story of that, but we know the the back. We're told this as having had taken place before the the film starts, and you understand that there's kind of an opportunistic element to it, right? Uh, Victor recognizes her attraction and her beauty, her energy. He calls it. She's not by far, by any means, the better singer, right? When they're having these auditions for the the Polish voices, right, for the people's music. Uh, she's not the real talent. She's obviously kind of a, uh, a con artist, I guess, you know, be a way of saying it. Yeah. But she has a certain kind of charisma based on that. And I think 
that uh, Joanna Kulig does bring this to her performance. I think she actually does have some kind of charisma in her part, but I agree that the chemistry between the two doesn't really exist. And I think that's precisely the point because it does strike me as this was uh, just a tumultuous relationship. It really wasn't good. There's maybe some sexual chemistry and energy between them, but beyond that, there's nothing. And they keep trying to make a go of it and it keeps failing. And uh, I think that is what this movie is showing, right? Uh, just a doomed connection that really can't be redeemed. They both would actually be much better at leaving each other alone and moving on without each other, but they keep being drawn into the self-destructive uh, relationship, and that's ultimately where it goes as, as you watch the film. It, it becomes clearly self-destructive uh, at the very end as they commit suicide. So I think that is the purpose of it. I, I actually didn't think that as a knock against the movie, but as a part of its merits. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I felt like the the film was trying to get us to root for them throughout, even though I, I agree with you, it's pretty clear that it's a doomed relationship. Um, but I, I guess I didn't feel convinced that that's what we were meant to feel throughout the entire duration of the story. I mean, I, it, it it's kind of a a tough balance to, to strike, I guess, because, you know, as the audience, we see two people that appear to be in love or at least in lust. I mean, I, most of this relationship se- seems to be based on lust more than anything. And you hope that they forge some kind of connection, especially within this really tumultuous environment of post-war Poland and, um, and wanting to break free from the constraints of communism. Uh, so it seems like the film is trying to communicate that whole theme of, well, love transcending these bonds, so to speak. And maybe that's too on the nose. Um, you know, maybe that's not what uh, the director is interested in, but uh, it, it does seem to want us to believe that at certain points. It just, it, it seemed a bit convoluted to me, I, I guess, in terms of how, um, like you said, the story is, is pretty fragmented. It's hard to really get an emotional foundation laid because the story is so fragmented and, and and jumps between so many different time periods that we never really quite see why they're so interested in pursuing each other over such a long period of time beyond, uh, as you said, the, the physical chemistry. And and maybe that's all there is to it. uh, But usually that fizzles out pretty quickly I think for most people and it's not necessarily something that's going to sustain a desire to see someone over what appears to be you know over a decade well I I think the reason why it works in this film because you're right that would be the case but their their story is regularly interrupted by other forces right so he goes to France so Victor is in France uh, and uh, Zula does not come with him, right? But then she sneaks out afterwards. They have a little brief exchange, a little brief connection. And then there's, again, the breaking things up, right? So, I mean, it goes back and forth, back and forth. And so they're not together consistently for those 10 years. They have these almost these little escapes with each other. And that's where I think it yeah. is believable. It's, you know, to borrow a phrase, I guess, that's very popular now, it's the classic example of a toxic relationship. Neither one of them is better at the end of these these times where they come together, but there is some sort of sense of, well, maybe I can make this work. I, there's an attraction here, and I, I want to figure out that initial energy, that initial uh, response that we had to each other. I want to try to capture that back in a bottle and see if we can make this work, because I like that, and they're chasing after it like a drug addict almost, uh, and they're destroying each other in the same time. Neither one of them is bringing each other happiness. And that ultimately kind of, I think, is partly behind the title, Cold War, uh, because there is a sense that these two are like uh, the the U.S. and the Soviets, uh, that there is just a, a natural like drawing together and a, a sense that these systems are not going to work is in a political sense for these countries. Well, I think you have that with these two characters, uh, that you're you're kind of always at war with each other. You're never in a full-blown heated battle, so to speak, but they're just upset with each other regularly trying to make something work that they can't they're irreconcilable and so i see this couple in a certain sense becoming uh in many ways a sense of east and west and uh victor seems very much more western zula seems very much more eastern uh in that sense 
I think well, I can see where you're going with that, but I, I think that's kind of a stretch for this film. I maybe that was the intent, but I don't think the Soviet Union and, and the United States, for instance, ever had a lustful relationship, so to speak. Uh, they always seem to be really at odds from the get go, and I, well, not during the the Roosevelt years, anyway. Well, that's that's true, but. It's, I, I, as an analogy, I, I, th- I still think it's it's a bit of a stretch. I, I think the, um, I guess it's the inconsistency of Zula in particular, and just her erratic nature, uh, that really undermines a lot of this, from a at least from a emotional standpoint as a through line in the film, and it's kind of hard to understand again, beyond the lust component, why someone like Victor would would be, uh, to bring up your, your comparison to drug addiction, would be addicted uh, for such a long period of time. Because he seems like such a level-headed, logical, reasonable kind of person, uh, even though, obviously, he's very committed to his uh, craft as a musician and is willing to really go to extraordinary lengths to preserve that, that lifestyle. Um it just, it seems like on paper, these people shouldn't really be attracted to each other necessarily, or, you know, shouldn't be able to, to forge a meaningful connection. And, and yeah, as you said, maybe that's what the film is trying to do. Maybe that's what's, what the film is trying to say that, that these people are incompatible, even though they have this, this uh, sense of lust, uh, it, it's hard to, re- I guess, really specify why I, I feel like it just doesn't quite coalesce. And, and, and again, maybe it's more the, the storytelling style and the fragmentation of the story itself that's problematic. But I think it ultimately comes down to Zula's character and and how unlikable she is and how selfish she, she is. And, yeah, granted, that, that can lead to a, a destructive relationship, a toxic relationship, but again, I still feel like the, the film is trying to get us to root for them, even though it's clearly a, a doomed scenario. Well, I wonder, I mean, I think you're right that she's not a likable character. If we can focus on her, uh, Zula is very selfish. She is obviously also quite um, undisciplined. I mean, she just goes into yeah. everything foolishly, uh, haphazardly, and uh, destructively, I mean, she just seems to make a mess out of anything she does. Uh, so I can agree with you that as I'm watching this from the outside, that you go, man, that is just terrible, right? Um, and I think the filmmaking is meant to be that way, and that's why we see her in such a clear light. Uh, because I've, we all had seen other people and other relationships where you look at them and say, yeah, that isn't going to work. And the people in it themselves don't see it, right? And I think of that as being what we have here, that these characters aren't seeing the film the way we are. They don't have the advantage of the cinematography to highlight the fact that this is such a despairing kind of situation, right, with the use of the negative space and the landscapes. They don't have the sense of the production design that shows this as being kind of just dark and dank at times. They... They don't have the advantage of the editing that fragments it up that we do. And I think that's that's part of the filmmaking, of, uh, kind of guiding us through this to see them kind of stripped of any of the luster that you might typically put in these kinds of stories. Uh, it'd be very easy to take this story, these characters, and frame it and film it a little differently, much more kind of the way I was expecting it, where you'd have that sense of, well, she's just this kind of carefree spirit and he is this you know, man who wants to move on and create something, you know, whatever it might be, uh, like a star is born or something to that effect, uh, where you see those kinds of uh, love stories of these two different artists that are kind of doomed in the relationship, but you're kind of caught up in the romance of it all. I think this is uh, Pavlovsky's a chance to try to maybe pull back the veil on that kind of cliched story and you know focusing in on the unlikableness of the character 
is a bold choice. I think it's it's a provocative choice. Um, it, it's just to bring back to A Star Is Born, the Bradley Cooper version that came out maybe the same year or year before this. I don't remember what year it came out. But uh, that film, as I remember it, did everything it did it could possibly do to make you like Bradley Cooper's character, even though he was an alcoholic, he was embarrassing, selfish, destructive, all those things. They did everything they could to make you say, I like him. And I think this film just decides, nah, we're not going to do that for you as the audience. We're going to throw you into the reality of these characters as they are. And that, to me, is, I think, a bold choice that I appreciated in uh, the storytelling. But I can agree that I, I can agree that I think the ending doesn't work that great in this movie. I would say that. That's yeah, and that's the part where it really lost steam for me. I guess I I was bought into it for the first I would say half or even two thirds of the film, and then as Zula gets more off the rails, it just got to be a bit absurd for me. And then of course you have the very Shakespearean ending, and it, it just all felt a bit too rote at that point um, for me. But I it felt like. I, I it felt like they had to have an ending to the movie. They couldn't just have it be, you know what? They kind of went, they just kind of fell out of love or they just kind of went separate ways or it just never came together or they just kind of, until they were in their old age, you know, <laughs> kind of the way it would maybe be because it felt very contrived that he gets back into Poland, goes to the prison camp, is set free from the prison camp, and then they commit suicide together. It just... It struck me as being a little too movie-ish as opposed to what would have probably realistically have happened in this kind of a scenario. Well, yeah, I, I would agree. And not only getting released in the prison camp, I mean, the way he got released, right? So she um, pairs up with the political officer, so to speak. Uh, I need to find that actor's name uh, because... Boris Zhik, I think. Is yeah, the... he, he's... He is great in this film. I mean, yeah, his performance... Play Kasmeric, yeah. Yeah, really stands out. I mean, uh, I I found him more memorable than the leads. <laughs> uh, he just had that perfect kind of sliminess to him. And... Uh, but just the fact that, you know, throughout her life, she really avoided commitment and avoided all these scenarios where maybe she could end up with Victor and then only at the very end does she have a full level of commitment to the point where she's willing to uh, uh, marry and have a child with another man to to set Victor free. Uh, Of course, the ultimate, I suppose, uh, uh, admission of her love is is the suicide itself. But, you know, I I think of a film like, uh, I know this is probably coming way out of left field, um, Uh, Princess Mononoke by um, Miyazaki, the anime. Matt, that's not out of left field. That's like from an entirely different sport. (laughs) (laughs) Well, just just bear with me. So that's another film about you know doomed lovers or a star you know star crossed lovers, and that that film has a very mature ending to it. You know, the main characters are they know that they cannot have a future together, and it's not this. Uh, if we can't be together, we'll die kind of scenario that we're seeing here that, again, feels very contrived and very rote. It's a a maturity of realizing that, admitting to that, and just going their separate ways. And, okay, well, maybe these characters aren't very mature, but I I think that would have been a stronger ending to this film. I I, I guess I I just wanted to see the film go less off the rails. I, I... it felt just very, as you said, movie-ish to see Zula, you know, becoming an alcoholic and throwing herself at, at all these men and and uh, being the femme fatale of, of the jazz nightclub, so to speak. I, it just was kind of disappointing to me that the film went that way because it just seemed like the obvious choice. Yeah, no, I'd agree. Having been so counterintuitive in its execution and its development that go down the very obvious route of okay suicide they both kill each other uh and the the kind of melodramatic 
returning back into Russia, knowing you'll go to prison for having tried to get to her. I, I agree with you that that does seem contrived. So that's a knock against this movie, but not enough that I wouldn't like the movie or that I wouldn't recommend the movie. I think I think it still is a pretty strong film overall. And I, I don't want to be entirely negative about it because there are a lot of things I do like about this film a lot. So, I, I mean, let's talk about the visuals because that to me that's the strongest part of this film. It, it's just an absolutely gorgeous film to look at. Uh, I mentioned the framing, just the use of the 4x3, the black and white. It's really one of the most visually striking films I've seen in a long time. And and it's, yeah, really a pleasure to look at. Uh, but, you know, how, how much do the visuals carry this film? I, I think it carries it a lot. And uh, without that really nostalgic um, aesthetic choice, I think the film would not play as well at all. You might be right about that, but I wonder to what extent does the aesthetic execution of it also help with developing its themes, right? I think the academic ratio, having it just to that, you know, that uh, four by three, you know, maybe it's not that, um, that's not that big of a deal. I mean, I think if it had been a, a traditional 185, that probably would have played very similar in many ways. Um, but having the the black and white certainly does aid the sense of it being a really, truly period piece, and it strips it down to its essentials, which I think is part of the way the the film is structured and edited, right, is to be very essential. And the fact that it's only you know, an hour and a half. It's, it's just a very lean story in that regard. And it's characters are very lean. So I do think that you're right, that it probably helps to stand out, probably gets some of the attention. You don't see that many black and white films today. And so whatever you do, it does sort of capture, I think at least critics eyes, um, particularly, you know, at the festival circuits. Uh, but I think that, it's okay that this is a kind of a blending of style and substance. I think that the style is part of the film's substance, uh, for this, if that makes sense. Yeah, I I see what you're getting at. It it would just be much less of a film without its style, I think, uh, because the, I I guess we've gone over some of the flaws of the, uh, the screenplay and the, maybe the thematic, you know, lack of clarity, but I, I do think that um, th- that's what pe- most people are going to take away from this film. Or just just visually, how how gorgeous it is, and and the music too. That the ethnic uh, traditional Polish folk songs are pretty haunting. You know, pretty effective. Our, our last conversation about Godzilla had kind of a similar use of of uh, a choir to. Uh, really kind of cut through uh, the audience emotionally. And, and this film uses those kinds of songs to great effect. And uh, Being half Ukrainian, I, I grew up listening to a lot of music like this, uh, especially through my grandparents. And a lot of the traditional dress that we see in those sequences is actually very, very similar to traditional Ukrainian outfits. So I, that was meaningful to me just on a personal level kind of seeing that because uh that was kind of part of my uh part of my youth so very very impactful i I love how those stage performances are shot to the use of just the symmetrical framing and the long lenses and they're really 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 striking uh lighting as well so just visually the whole film looks great but those sequences in particular really stand out to me yeah, no, I, I think that a lot of it is visually daring. Uh, it's bold. Uh, I was really struck with the, uh, the the ethnic element, how it is captured in the music as well as in the costume design. What I was most intrigued by actually was the the stuff that was taking place in France uh, and just the the sense of the artist in France. I know it's not exactly the most unique because we've certainly seen plenty of other films like that but 
I think the the sense of the isolation, the loneliness, and the way they just they stage scenes in, the, especially that initial encounter in France where the streets are empty, he, they're meeting at that bar at the very end of the night as it's closing up. Those are just smart directorial decisions about how to stage something and then use your imagery to really convey the, the internal psychology of the characters and the sense of them being kind of just in a different world uh, than really either where neither of them really fit. Right. Uh, He's not really truly at home in France. They're not really truly going to be able to be a part of French society. I think all that's being conveyed very quickly just by the simple way in which they've actually staged uh, some of those scenes. So I was really impressed with that. And then I think you, you know, the point you made about the music and the jazz um, is what struck me as well, because I think this has very much that jazz feel to it where it is just kind of different instruments play at different points of time, right? That's jazz. It's just, it's kind of improvising. It's kind of moving around. And this film, because it kind of just goes, all right, here's a segment and here's a segment and here's a segment has that same kind of sense of, it's just popping into a new part here, popping into a new part here. Now we're focusing on this. Now we're focusing on that. Here's where they are again. Uh, so I, I get the sense that the film uh, is very much at, in love with jazz. I don't know if Pavlikovsky has a, a background playing jazz or if he uh, was an aficionado of jazz clubs or something like that, but I get the sense he must be on some level because it does feature so prominently in this film. What's your I thought about just the, his use of negative space on it? I was struck by it. I'm not sure exactly how I'm interpreting his use of it though, and how to interpret it yet. Um, I, you mentioned, well, I think that he, he did the same thing in Ida. So yeah. what, what's your take on how, just that way of composing the shots? I'm kind of mixed on it, I guess. I, I think it calls attention to itself, at least for me, when I, I watch a film like this, I notice things like that. And maybe a general audience wouldn't necessarily, but being someone who's into cinematography and into lens choices and, and things of this nature, uh, it stands out to me right away. And it, whenever something calls attention to itself, it's not necessarily a good thing, I guess. I, I Maybe it's something that should be reserved for impactful moments in the film. But it, it does kind of uh, create a new visual language, which I find intriguing, right? Uh, there's it's just a very unique way of using that aspect ratio. And, and I wasn't surprised to see that here because I had seen Ida before. If, if I hadn't seen Ida, uh, I'd probably be even more into this film because of, of, um, how those frames are composed. But, uh, you know, just looking at a still from this film. Yeah. It's, it's gorgeous. It looks great. The use of negative space is interesting. And, you know, but when when you're watching the film, it does take me out of it a bit. And Pavlikovsky, it's hard to say if this is just what he likes in terms of his visuals or if he's trying to make a thematic comment here, right? I, when the negative space is used in this film, it always seems to be really capturing other people in the room and other activities going on or just kind of the, the mass of a crowd so I think it thematically it's it's probably really trying to convey how these characters are alone or how they're uh, really isolated, even though they may be among large groups of people. So I, I do think that he's trying to relay some things thematically, but overall it just seems like that's the aesthetic that he likes. I got the sense it must be partly a personal preference of how to compose a shot. Yeah, just because he uses it so prominently and it is such an unusual way of doing it that you would think if you just wanted to try to highlight certain thematic points, you would only use it sparingly. I'm I'm a big fan of negative space. I, I, I think it can look really great and often makes uh, in a way most audiences might not pr- appreciate just a different impression upon the audience. So if it's done well, I think it's really effective. I obviously typically think of it more in the scope ratio where you can play with it more in the horizontal sense. This one, obviously you play with it a lot more in the vertical sense because that's just 
the nature of the frame. Uh, and it does have this interesting effect of, like you said, creating a greater awareness of the environment around the characters and diminishing them. You know, I think when you when you play with it in a scope ratio, oftentimes it gives that sense of uh, pushing them off to a side and not necessarily making them seem smaller, but making them just feel maybe more isolated or more, uh, you know, kind of uh, estranged or distanced. With this, it necessarily makes everything seem so very small, and everybody kind of just gets the sense of something's looming over them. And I wonder to what extent is this a way in which he's also just trying to reflect the fact that in Poland at that time, there always was something over you, right? I mean, everybody's aware that they're being watched. Everybody's aware that there's secret police. Uh, they have to be very careful to, about what they say, what they do. Is that a somewhat of a sense of how he's trying to convey something about just the nature of a of a surveillance state uh, that these characters all would have lived in? I'm not sure if that was a thought there or not, and maybe it was just simply he he likes the look of it. Uh, but I I do see how it could have the extra impact of creating that sense that they're in a a communist system that has really no sense of privacy and something looming over you all the time. Yeah, it can convey an oppressive quality for sure. And, and, and that may be part of the intent, but um, overall it just seems like that's his aesthetic or at least for uh, this film and the preceding film. But overall I like it. I mean, I think it's, it's striking and it, it is neat to use the vertical in that four by three frame in a creative way. Um, as you said, versus the horizontal and more of a scope frame. Um, but, I mean, you, you mentioned kind of the, the specter of communism. I, not, not to get overly political here, but w- one thing that always kind of fascinates me is I, this isn't the first film that has obviously depicted communism as a very uh, suffocating and restrictive system to live under, uh, especially for artists. But I, I find it so fascinating that it seems like just in general, uh, many in the artistic community or many people that are artistic seem to be in support of, you know, socialist ideas or communist ideas, uh, which is in stark contrast to what we're seeing here. So, well, I uh, think it's the, it's a fascinating point and it's obviously one that, as Americans, we may not is ever it, really fully appreciate. Well, is it ignorance, right. I guess? Is it ignorance? Is it not truly understanding what that system means? I think, yeah, I think uh, it's or, just or not is getting it just a sense, sense Or is it just a sense of rebellion, you know? Is it just uh, the idea that, well, we just have to rebel against whatever system is in place? Well, I think the artist, by very nature, may have that kind of um, a creativity, and thus they want to express it, and they want to push a boundary that isn't... I mean, whatever your system might be, there's going to be something that in, that puts a border on you, and then you want to go. Well, I want to go right one step past that, right? So, whether it's from a religious system or from a political system, that's probably always going to be a little bit there. But I think what might be something that American artists don't really appreciate is the idea of the government actually saying, "This is what you will do, and yeah. we're going to take over this, and we really are in charge of this." And then to know that by not complying with it, you could be thought of as an enemy of the state, right? I mean, American artists, I think, like to fancy themselves as enemies of the state, and they might like to fancy themselves as, uh, you know, being almost always on the verge of being coerced into doing something, but they have an incredible amount of freedom. Uh, You know, but uh, just imagine uh, if our current um, Hollywood, or uh, if you want to go with anybody in uh, music, if they were requ- required to start doing, by law, by force, uh, campaign rallies and events for Donald Trump, because that happens <laughs> to be the current existing government, I, you could see, obviously, how they would absolutely freak out about it, right? And that's ultimately what I think artists in uh, Poland would have been experiencing, or anybody behind the Iron Curtain. Just the simple fact that you're being told your art has to be at the service of the state, and we decide what that is probably is a pretty shocking thing for anybody and i think there's always gonna be an artist a a pushback against that kind of totalitarianism well it should be a lesson i suppose to people that uh support any kind of 
uh, political extremism, whether it be right or left. I mean, that this is where ultimately things can end up. Well, just and, when you start to have uh, politics take over everything, right? I mean, when, you, when that goes, then everything does have to serve the state, right? Yeah. Whether it's a, a fascist state or a communist state, they wind up with that same totalitarian instinct being realized. And so art has to be at the service of the state, which is, to me, of course, completely against the nature of art. It's meant to be Obviously, at the maybe at the service of of the common good, but not of a particular governing party. Yeah, it's meant to be, you know, free of the of those constraints, right? It's about freedom of expression. So, right. a transcendence um, should be a part of it. Yeah, it it should be for for art that endures. Anyway, we'll turn to Criterion's release itself here. So, the, again, this was released last year. I think it was last November or so. I, there were rumors that this may be Criterion's first 4K title because this was released on uh, 4K on, for streaming on Amazon, but of course that did not occur. Um, do you, do you have the Blu-ray, Nate, or did you stream this on Amazon? Uh, I have the Blu-ray. Oh, okay. Yep, I picked it up at the Barnes and Noble completist, sale. You completest. Yes. You yeah. Well, <laughs> if I hadn't been for the Barnes and Noble sale, I probably wouldn't have picked it up. Uh, but you know, getting it for half price, I was willing to do it. Yeah. So I yeah I don't have the disc, but uh, it seems like it's got a few good features here. Conversation with um, Pavlikovsky and Inuritu, and the can press conference, a couple making of bits. I, nothing too extensive in terms of a special edition, but uh, it seems like a pretty nice release. Yeah. Well, that conversation between Inyaritu, excuse me, that conversation between Inyaritu and Pavlikovsky was very just interesting to see how they talk. And obviously, with both directors having made films about their experiences, their their backgrounds, their their countries of origin, it was just in black it, and white. Yep. It's just interesting to see how they they talked about that and how they you know made you know. Um, Made that really, really well. Uh, I think you're confusing Inyari too with Coron. Oh Coron. yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> scratch like, that. You're right. I, I, I was, was thinking like, about Roma. Yeah, I was thinking like, what what was the Inyari two film in black and white that I'm not thinking of? <laughs> <laughs> so no, but I was thinking of like Amoros Peros and, and and things like that. Which yeah, uh, you know, he just they have obviously very different styles, but they have a certain kind of. Um, Parallel that was just interesting to see and that coming through in their in their uh, conversation. Uh, that was probably the highlight of the special features to me. But it looks gorgeous. I think I, I did watch uh, just a little bit to compare with the 4K uh, streaming, uh, and I obviously the 4K looks gorgeous as well on on the Amazon Prime. So anybody who's got that, I'd recommend that they do take a look at this because it'll render the image beautifully. Uh, but this is a very good looking solid presentation on disc as well. Any more closing thoughts on on Cold War? So this uh, very popular title, I, I think, at least in the art house scene, past few years. But does it deserve to be in the Criterion Collection? I'm going to say no. Uh, I liked it. It's it's a good film. I don't think it's an important film. I don't think that uh, Pavlikovsky has shown himself to be an important director yet. Uh, maybe in time he will be seen as one, but I can't say that I'm seeing anything here that indicates to me that this is a voice that we really want to make sure that doesn't get lost for prosperity uh, uh, or, excuse me, for posterity. Uh, so I think that this is not something that deserves to be in the Criterion Collection. Perfectly good movie, but not worthy of the collection. I would agree. No surprise. I, I think the film is still worth seeing. It's still worth checking out, really for the visuals more than anything else. But I, I still remain disappointed with it, and hopefully it's something that might, again, uh, reward repeat viewing. So we'll see. Well, thanks for joining us this evening. Our next film will be Sam Peckinpah's Straw Dogs. Have a good evening, and keep collecting. Keep collecting.